The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you all can hear me. My name is Rick Gastelum. I'm the uh, CFO for the Washington Farm Bureau, and I'm also in charge of our grants um, projects. Uh, I'd like to welcome you today to this webinar, Nine Steps to Safety Excellence, uh, brought to you by the Farm Bureau Solution Services. And uh, this grant, uh, this webinar is brought to you free today. Um, we received a Human Resources Risk Management Grant a year ago, and part of that involved providing some uh, free or, or no cost education to the agricultural industry. So uh, this is a webinar uh, we've given a few times over the last few years, um, but it's really good information. Um, uh, Jeff Lutz, who is one of our safety directors at the Washington Farm Bureau, will be explaining, you know, how, how do you get your workers to work safely? Um, you know, one of, one of the things uh, when I used to work out in safety in the industry and consulting with businesses is we, you know, we can no longer expect people just to have common sense, you know, because really when you think about it, who has the ruler for common sense when it comes to life experiences, work history, and so when you're dealing with a large population, especially in Washington, heavy uh, in labor for the agricultural industry, how do you get people all moving in the same direction to think safely and act safely every day? A um, few uh, housekeeping things, then I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. Uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, you can pop populate those in the question box in your pane. Uh, maybe if there's somebody out there could chat and put it something in the chat that you can hear us okay, that would be great, just for a little uh, um, confirmation. Um, and I will be responding to questions and giving you answers as Jeff is chatting. Um, but if there's a, a good question that comes in uh, that I feel may be appropriate for the whole audience to hear, I'll go ahead and pause Jeff and um, uh, share the question with him so, he, so everybody can hear the answer. Uh, last little piece of information, there's uh, some handouts available for you. Uh, there's a PDF copy of today's PowerPoint, and then there's an employee, uh, I'm sorry, Nine Steps to Safety Excellence. It's a document that is a reminder and gives you more details as to what the nine steps are. We don't actually have a copy of the PowerPoint in there, but we have some background foundational information uh, should you want to refer back to any of the steps and some more information that is there for you. Um, so with that, I got a, okay, good. Thank you for uh, somebody um, commented in that they can hear us loud and clear. Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Lutz. Uh, again, he's a safety director with our Washington Farm Bureau Retro Safety Program, and I'll have him uh, talk a little bit about himself and his, uh, uh, his experience and then jump right in. There you go, Jeff. Rick, thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, it's a busy time of year know what's going on right now it's the end of September last day of September happy end of September everyone um, it's harvest time and you guys are all busy so thank you for taking time to um, step away from that for a few minutes and and go over um, kind of the nine steps for safety excellence you notice we say safety excellence it's something that that takes time and we'll talk about that uh, today. So my background is uh, agriculture. I grew up in the uh, tree fruit industry, uh, some dry land wheat, um, grew up uh, working in the fields. And uh, I remember asking my grandmother why she was making me work uh, menial jobs in the field and, and hand labor and those types of things. And she'd say, well, because someday you'll be the boss and I want you to know how this is. So. And we'll talk about that a little bit today as we go through this presentation on never do something that you wouldn't do yourself. Never have someone do something that you wouldn't do yourself. So that's that's kind of how I grew up in the uh, in the industry, uh, educated in in the horticulture field, and and have a have a background um, running farms and and doing my own farming for a number of years, and then. Uh, came to work for Farm Bureau. I was a volunteer leader for a number of years and then came to work for Farm Bureau in uh, 1998. So I've been doing this for a number of years. Um, Labor and Industries got a bunch of training from them, kind of an education on how they do things, what they look at, and um, 
so that background uh, in agriculture really helped me as I'm learning the, the rules. And our job at Farm Bureau is to help you with the rules. It's to help you keep into compliance with those rules and not necessarily have to go and research the rules. So as, as we go through this, remember that as we're, as we're talking safety, if you don't know the rules, ask us, because there's three of us. There's myself, there's Corwin Fisher, there's Dominic Damian. Uh, we have a, a new gentleman aboard, Luis Isioria, and Luis is part-time claims and part-time safety. And the, the amongst the three and a half of us, because Luis is spending part of his time doing the claims part, Amongst us, we can get the answers for you. Uh, we probably have them off the top of our heads. If we don't, we'll go get them for you. And we'll never go and say to a, a regulator, say, Joe at ABC Farms has this question and uh, we're asking for him. We ask in general terms and get the answers from the regulators and get them back to you. So it gives you a bit of insulation there. So. So let's jump right in and talk about nine steps to safety and, and that commitment to excellence. So let me start by saying this is a, it's a journey. It's uh, you, you can't just do this once and say, hey, look at that, we're done. Because it's gonna take time. It's going to be something that you're going to have to measure in terms of documentation and then go back and review that documentation. In fact, if you look at rules, for safety and health in the workplace, if you have written policies and procedures, which you should, um, they are required to be reviewed annually. And the idea is that you go back and look at it. And, and it, once a year you're reviewing, how did we do last year? How are we doing next year? And uh, that's where this nine steps comes in. So let's talk a bit about leadership qualities because uh, you may be the owner operator, and if you're the owner operator, you've got a lot on your plate. You may be an HR manager. You may be a, a full safety professional. That's what you do for the company is safety. Uh, no matter what your title is, uh, you're a leader, and you have to uh, lead in certain ways. Remember me talking about growing up on the farm and my grandmother saying, you know, me saying to my grandmother, why, why am I doing this menial labor? Well, because if you're going to be in the trenches with someone, you have to know how to do it. And good leaders are those people. They're ones that are willing to jump in. And from time to time, there'll be jobs that employees are doing that you may not completely understand. And when you say to an employee, you're, you're the safety person for a company, and you say to an employee, how do you do your job? Teach me how. Uh, that's a good leader. That's someone that takes that leadership power, gives it away to someone else, and then they learn through that. So if you look at what type of leaders there are, there's, there's you know, what, what's considered a good leader? Well, that leader may be someone that it's authoritative, that says, this is the solution, and you're, this is the way I want you to do it. But the better leaders are the ones that are kind of transactional leaders. They'll say, hey, um, it's not that you work for me and I'll provide for you. It's not that at all. It's someone that can do a relationship exchange, that they can um, look at, at um, transforming the culture that they work with. And that's really one of the key steps to safety is transforming that culture. You, what you end up doing is you, you mentor and you coach and you develop others and you build this this group of future leaders in your, within your organization. That's the key to nine steps for safety. So with that, let's, let's jump in and talk real quickly about what we're going to cover today. So, you know, we, how do we want to make sure that we do things safely, that we do it the right way? Well, if you're gonna stand on a ladder and you're gonna hang on and have someone stand on your back and you're gonna lift a bunch of trusses up and install those, it's probably not the way, to, maybe you should get a bigger ladder. Maybe you should have a scissor lift. Maybe you should have hard hats and uh, a, a crane, a lifting crane that comes in and lifts those. All of these ideas are to say, well, let's protect the worker. And many times, like I said, the worker will have the right thing to do, ask them. What do you need? So in this in this development of your nine safety steps, um, 
one of the very first ones you can have is a written safety and health policy. Uh, if you do not have an accident prevention program, a safety policy, a safety plan, a safety handbook, if you don't have that, please get in contact with one of us at the Washington Farm Bureau. We will help you develop those plans. Um, we, we kind of know, depending on what your operation is, what types of safety um, protocols you may need in a, in a safety plan. Maybe you don't need a very robust lockout tagout system in your safety plan, written, documented procedures. Maybe you do. If you need that, then that's our job to help you with that. If you're members with us, we help you get those in place. We help you do those. So remember, as I'm talking about safety plans, it's more than just this. I mean, this first part is a, it's a statement. It's a safety and health policy. It's a guidance for the company that says um, the owner, the president, the key management people, they're the ones that are going to sign it and they're gonna say, this is what we want. Because remember, we're building a culture. We're building people's confidence in the company and we're, we're moving forward. Um, it needs to be on company letterhead and posted where people can see it. It needs to be reviewed with new employees. Um, it should probably be the first thing that we talk about all the time. Uh, it shows your concern for protecting people. I come to work in the morning with all my fingers and toes, with my eyes, with my hearing, with my respiratory system. I wanna go home at the end of the day in the same condition I came to work in. So that's, that's really what it is, is it's this commitment. It's uh, telling people, hey, we are going to have a safe workplace here. So I'm gonna use that and I'm gonna say, well, I need some visible leadership from the upper management. Um, remember I said, if you're teaching people and you're mentoring them and you're coaching them, it's not just a, oh, you are required to do this. This is, this is how it is. It's my way or the highway. Um, that's not what we're after. What we're after is something that people can feel free to have this information exchange. And that senior management leadership uh, is something that's very important to where employees get a, get a sense of, hey, what, what is it that the, that the company wants? Uh, most people, if they're coming to work at the beginning of the, the their employment, they're coming there, you've given them uh, employment paperwork that they need to do for all the HR stuff. You're going to give them an orientation. Um, Rick Gastelum did that when we started the webinar, kind of gave you an orientation of what's going to happen. Uh, you're giving them that information. They're overwhelmed with information. So if you're telling them multiple times, management is in charge and management wants to make sure that uh, you go home at the end of the day with the same fingers and toes, eyes and ears that you came to work with. That's an important part. So this management leadership, being out with people, having them uh, understand that, that you have the ability to commit resources to safety in the workplace. Um, we uh, have a member that is recently moving moving forward with some some higher level safety in their workplace and they've hired a they're a smaller company they've only got about uh, 20 full-time employees and they have hired a, a person that is going to do other jobs but he has he's been there about a year now and he uh, and we'll we'll call him Steve because that's his name so we'll call him Steve so Steve um, comes to work for this company and he, the company had always been doing safety meetings. We'll talk about that here briefly. Um, they used to always do safety meetings, have, have pretty robust safety meetings, but it's gone to another level since Steve's come on board. And there's been questions back from the employees of, why do I need to sign a roster that says I'm, I'm taking this, um, this training, this, this safety meeting I'm, I'm signing? Um, and what this shows is that the management of the company has said, it's not just important that we get your signature on a piece of paper. We want you to have knowledge and information as well. It's building this excellence. And that's what this company has done. Some of the questions back from the employees have been, well, wait a minute, if we sign this, we've just signed our rights away, correct? That means that if something happens and we were trained on it, then, um, we don't get treatment if we get injured. 
those are valid questions by employees, but you can see where that, and, and by the way, that is not true, but rumors abound and that they've been asked this, uh, by the company has been asked this by their employees. So it's an opportunity to teach people and to have them educated and learn, no, no, we're a company that we've, we've got these goals and we've got these uh, results that we want and we're, we're moving forward with those. We want you to know that by you signing this, you're not only acknowledging it, but you're participating in it. You're saying, yes, I was trained and oh, by the way, I, I, I think I should probably do that. If you look on step two at the very last bullet point, and it talks about enforcing safety policies. No one likes discipline. Nobody wants to enforce policies and procedures in an unfriendly manner. But the reality is there's times that you must enforce your policies, and that would include a disciplinary action plan. And if you don't have that in your written safety plan, get with us and we'll help you uh, put one of those to work. So. As you look through that, uh, that PowerPoint, I'm not gonna read it, you can see it, but you're setting goals and you're, you're making these standards. You're measuring your results, you're staying involved. And uh, then there's times that you're enforcing your policies and you need to uh, use a disciplinary action plan. That needs to be in your safety plan as well. Hey, hey Jeff, uh, one little thing, uh, if you wouldn't mind touching on it. Could you share with the audience the role of, um, so, you know, if you can go back a slide uh, for a second. Um, you know, it talks about visible senior management and leadership, and then we talk a lot about employees. You know, in this in this framework here, what what's sort of the role, or what do you see as some pitfalls when you're dealing with, um, you know, crew bosses, foremen, supervisors, who may not be considered senior management or an employee, but they're middle management? Great question. Um, the, the reality is, is that anyone that directs or oversees or uh, guides employees, hey, we're gonna go over to this block and we're gonna work over here on this block today, those are managers. Those are part of the leadership team. And, and with that, um, they may feel that they don't have the ultimate authority as the leadership uh, of the company, but they represent the company. And what, what Rick Gostellum is getting at is if you're there as a manager, as you're there as a, as a crew boss, uh, you might not be upper management. You, you don't set in in high level meetings with budgets and those types of things. You're a crew boss. You still are representing the company. You're still a manager. You're still someone that needs to promote and champion safety, that needs to uh, make sure that that um, safety responsibility, that everyone has that, that you hold people accountable to that. It's difficult to do sometimes. And that person can be the bridge between the company and the employee. One other component to that is when employees come to work, if it's a, let's say it's apple harvest and it's a hand harvest crew, that hand harvest crew comes in, they wanna know a couple things. One, they wanna know um, when payday is, they wanna know how much they're getting paid, they wanna know uh, where do I start because I'm here with my buddy and I hope we pick together. And um, they really don't care as much about safety. They, they know they don't wanna fall off a ladder, they've been to other orchards, they've been to other farms, they, they know they've gotten safety orientation with ladder safety and whatnot. But their, mo their main concern is, I'm gonna work hard, I'm going to make money, and I wanna know when payday is. And if you can help them realize, hey, we're, we're gonna use our tools here as leaders, as developers, as mentors and coaches, all of a sudden you're bringing these people up to a, to a higher level. Um, one of the easiest ways to get to them is say, you know that um, if you get hurt, you don't make as much money on the insurance side as you do working. So it's imperative that you that you work uh, and that you uh, do it safely. And if you can't do that here, then maybe you should seek employment somewhere else. Uh, that's easy to say and it's hard to apply because we don't have a unlimited um, labor force that can allow us to just um, fire people at will and and move on to the, to the next person. So, um, kind of expansion of, of, of what we were talking about. So how do I make sure that I've, I've got employees 
that are involved in the process. It goes back to what I was saying earlier about making sure that you're asking people. Do you ask them, how, you know, how's your job going? Um, is there anything I need to, to do to help you do your job better? Is there, um, are there conditions that, that maybe there's unsafe conditions that, that I'm not aware of? Um, and we'll talk here in a minute about um, safety checklists and inspection guidelines. Um, you're part of a team and it doesn't matter whether you came to work yesterday and you're a general laborer or if you're part of the management team, you're still that same team. It's still the same company. And it, it's, it's getting people involved and saying, hey, how, how do I make sure that I get people to do their job safely? Rather than, um, I'll go back to ladders, I'm going to stand on the top step of the ladder and put one foot on the ladder and one foot on the tree. Sooner or later, someone's going to fall and they're going to get hurt. And they've got a, a, a big bag of fruit and that fruit uh, adds to their weight and it adds to their balance. Uh, it takes away from their balance and adds to the opportunity to fall. So it, it's how are your employees doing their job? Um, and the only way to find out is you have to be there with them and you have to watch them and say, I'm going to go through once in a while and observe people uh, and realize too that you've got 10 other things you need to be doing, but that is a, is a critical part. Um, as I said at the beginning of, of step three, ask people. Ask them how you can help them. Now, so, some people are going to say, well, you know, I, I could use a brand new piece of equipment here. Well, that's, that might be something that needs to be done. In the future, I need a I need a, a, a hundred thousand dollar harvester. Well, that that's not going to happen today, but it's something that maybe uh, capital expenditures and budget in the future we can look at. But how do I how do I look at something today to make your job uh, better? How do I maybe it's maybe it's a new safety policy. Maybe it's um, um, ongoing safety meetings. Um, Maybe it's something that you that employees know about that uh, job better than you do, and certainly knowing that job better than you, ask them. The only way to find out is to ask them. You've got to you've got to get them involved, um, and it goes back to that leadership. You have to genuinely be concerned for them, uh, mentor them, coach them, get them in the direction they need to go. So how do I how do I make sure that I'm communicating to people? Well, if you look at this the bullet points on on this slide, you can say, well, the postings, you know, there's required posters, and and certainly you get those from us. Uh, you can get those from government agencies. Um, you food safety postings, all kinds of postings, uh, are, is probably the poorest way to communicate to folks because. They don't take the time to go and look at it. They don't take the time to go and read it. Um, it's it's easier if you just tell them, but they may not be listening because they may be saying, "Well, I'm 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 worried about where I'm going to work. I'm worried about when payday is. I'm worried about uh, how much I, I make per per bin, per box, whatever whatever the per hour, whatever the job may be." So some of the regular communications are uh, safety meetings. How do I make sure that I'm doing the right safety meeting at the right time of the year? Well, if you're in harvest and it's apples, you're probably talking about uh, pedestrian safety, the interaction between the tractors going up and down the roads and uh, certainly ladders, or maybe it's platforms that you're using. And, and you're, you're taking that time and you're saying, okay, um, here's, here's safety things that you need to, to take into consideration. And, and you're probably doing that every single day. Remember when we started the webinar, I said, do you want something um, documented? And the answer is yes. The trick question is, is would you rather have the documentation with someone's signature on it, or would you rather have them the knowledge and understanding? And it's a trick question because the answer is you want both. You want them to have knowledge and understanding of what you are conveying to them on safety and health, but you want their signature as well. Here's a scenario, someone's injured on the job. It's a pretty serious injury. They end up in the hospital. Labor and Industries gets wind of it uh, because of inpatient hospitalization overnight. 
and labor and industry shows up and they say, hey, Jeff got injured working for you. What kind of documentation do you have for his training on whatever the job was? What kind of documentation do you have? That's where the documentation is important. It was unfortunate that Jeff got injured, but now it's to the point where you need that documentation. That documentation is going to either make or break how the inspection goes. Other things you can do is um, having a, a, an open door policy. Now, I, I work for the Washington Farm Bureau. My boss, John Stumiller, is very, very good at having an open door policy. Uh, my door is open. If you need me, here I am. Um, making sure that employees know that they can approach you. One of the most difficult things for an employee um, is to ask their their boss um, pertinent questions. Uh, um, I don't want to look foolish, so I'm just going to act like I know how this operates. Um, here's an example. I grew up on a farm, lots of tractors, lots of machinery, lots of equipment, but it was for orchard. If you hired me today to come to work for you out on a uh, row crop farm, those tractors are way different than the tractors I learned to drive when I was a young man. But you ask me the question, Jeff, do you know how to operate a tractor? And I say, yeah, I can operate a tractor because I've got the opportunity to, to operate this nice big tractor that you've got. I don't have a clue on how to operate that tractor, but that wasn't the question you asked me. You asked me if I know how to operate a tractor. Yes, I do. Not that particular tractor, but I do. And that open door policy allows you to talk to people back and forth and say, hey, Jeff, do you know how to operate this particular tractor? Um, Jeff, if you have questions that you need of me, can you please come to me and ask me those questions? And that goes from the crew boss to the supervisor, to the management team, and ultimately to the owner of the company. Those all need to be part of that communication effort. Um, written communication is important. Um, it could be in a safety handbook. It could be in a uh, employee handbook. Um, HR is such now that there's there's very many, um, so many rules that you want to make sure you've got everything dotted, uh, all your I's dotted and all your T's crossed. The problem is, is that you're always going to miss something. Um, and if you're constantly in the workplace and you're constantly working with your employees and you're having that open door policy and you're working with them, you're going to, you're going to, discover those uh, deficiencies um, faster than if you just plug along and today's the day we're going to we're going to start apple harvest and uh, you didn't know that there were some some hazards that were involved that you need to to cover first let's talk about our employee orientation and training every single employee that that is working any job should have some sort of orientation rick Gastelum does some very good training and he used to always say, uh, hey, uh, Jeff, here's a new computer. You go ahead and run that computer. I've got a meeting I've got to go to. You'll figure that out, right? Um, a computer is a pretty benign product compared to a, a, a tractor or a piece of machinery, a, a, a hay baler, uh, much more complex. You're not going to turn someone loose on a $100,000 piece of equipment and say, you'll figure it out. There you go, I got a meeting to go to. Give them some training education. That training education is a, is a one-time orientation and in your handouts, you've got an employee orientation checklist. Now that checklist is very generic. It's something that you could use, but many of our employers look at those and say, ah, there's my guide and I'm going to expand upon that depending on what my operation is. When I was talking about safety meetings uh, a few minutes ago, those safety meetings should be tailored to whatever it is you're doing at that time of year. Uh, it's the same thing with an orientation. It may be something that you just do once a year with a harvest crew. Maybe you've got cherries and you're gonna do cherry harvest and it's just a seasonal temporary deal and you're gonna give that orientation to new employees. That orientation should cover as much as you can of um, lines of communication, what to do in emergencies, how to report unsafe conditions. Here's where chemicals are. And here's where information is for 
um, food safety. Those, those, all those things need to be in an orientation. Many of you are using videos. Uh, many of you are using uh, streamlined products, uh, maybe maybe apps, maybe handheld apps on your phone. There's some great products out there, but no matter what you do, make sure you get an orientation. So here's my question. Do you want their signature on a piece of paper for documentation, or do you want knowledge and understanding of what you're conveying to them? And the answer is both. You want both. Um, so orientation is a one-time event. Training is an ongoing event. Orientation is something that you do when you're doing an I-9 and a W-4 and doing some food safety and maybe worker protection standard training with videos and a basic orientation of lines of communication and unsafe condition reporting and those types of things. Training is something that you're going to do on an ongoing basis. It's more like a on-the-job training. I'm going to step in and uh, teach you the job. Um, learning to drive a, a car when you're when you're a young person. You're not going to just jump in and know everything about the car. It takes time. You have to learn. It's a, it's a process. And that training is the exact same thing for employees as they're jumping through uh, learning new, new processes, new procedures. Um, you may know that an employee, when they come on board, need a whole myriad of information, but you can't give it to them all at once. You've got to give it to them piecemeal. So I give them an I-9 and a W-4 and my orientation. And as time goes on, I know that Jeff needs way more training than what I'm giving him the first day. But it's like drinking water from a fire hose. You can't take it all at once. So start slow, do the orientation, get people accustomed to that training, and then continually train them. You're probably already doing this. The next question is, is, is it documented? Remember that as employees, especially in agriculture, we do many, many different jobs. As we're doing a job and we transfer from one job to another, make sure that people have an understanding of those new ways to do their, their job. Maybe it's personal protective equipment that they need to wear. I've been a tractor driver for years and now you've promoted me to a spray operator. I need some more in-depth and advanced training as a spray operator than I ever did as a tractor driver. Uh, maybe I have been on a general cleanup crew in a warehouse, and now you're moving me more into a maintenance role. Uh, I need way more information on a maintenance role than I ever did on a sanitation crew or a cleanup crew. Uh, maybe the, the uh, crew for maintenance, I need a, an in-depth study of lockout tagout. Maybe there's a confined space that I'm going to go into for some maintenance. Ah, there's some written programs that need to be reviewed and written programs that need to be make sure that the people are staying safe and that's that that extra training. So an orientation is is great at the very beginning. And like I say, you've got the orientation checklist that you can use. Uh, make sure that you are giving people that advanced training as they go through. Let's talk real quick about uh, those those programs and the guides that you use. Um, if you are working on a piece of machinery and it's a shop and I'm just jumping in to do some repairs on a, on a tractor with an implement on the back of it, do I, need, do I really need lockout tag out for that? And the answer is yes, you do. You need some sort of system to make sure that the employee that's operating that has knowledge and information of, I should isolate the engine, the hydraulics, and gravity. We had a uh, fatality in our program one year where a gentleman crawled underneath a piece of equipment and held it up with a jack and the hydraulics bled off and the, he kicked the jack over and the machine landed on top of him and crushed him and killed him. He should have blocked that up first it's easy to step back and say, gee, we should have done that before. Gee, we should have had a written lockout tagout program. It doesn't need to be much other than, hey, if we're gonna get in harm's way from some machine or equipment, make sure it's in a zero energy state, which would include gravity. So there's there's those abstract things that might end up being in a in a in a program on a policy and procedure that needs to be written down and then communicated with employees. Uh, what about chemicals? What if you are using chemicals in the workplace? 
It's like Rick Costellum telling me, here's your new computer. I've got a meeting to go to. You go ahead, you'll figure it out. Mm, that might be okay with a computer. It's not okay with chemicals. It needs to be written down, spelled out, have some sort of uh, um, process that you're doing for your chemicals. Most of you, uh, most people, in the state of Washington, we're one of the safest states for agriculture workers in the nation. We do a great job. And this is just a reminder to make sure how you get excellent at what you do. So if someone's stepping from a tractor driver uh, to a spray operator, you're gonna spend some more time with them about the operations of a sprayer. You're gonna spend more time with them about personal protective equipment. You're gonna spend more time with them uh, talking about chemicals and some of the things that you need to have in place for um, the worker protection standard because it's much more in depth now. It's, it's stepped to another level. And all of that needs to be written down and then effectively communicated to employees. It's your guide, it's your goals, it's your policy, it's something that you move forward with. Um, if you look at step six on the uh, PDF handout, there's a full list there of different things that you might need to have written down and included in your accident prevention program. They're looking towards the middle of the page, lockout, tagout, hazardous energy control, vitally important. Uh, maybe they're working just with ladders. You should have something written down on how you're gonna convey information to folks with, with ladders. Giving them the information they need to keep themselves safe and make sure that they go home at the end of the day with all their fingers and toes, their eyes and ears, everything that they started out uh, at the beginning of, uh, of work with. Step seven, do you need a safety coordinator? Remember the story of the of the uh, uh, member that has, they, they've got about 20 employees, they've stepped forward and said, we want a safety coordinator. His name is Steve. Steve is not, he doesn't just do safety. He does multiple other things as well. But Steve spends his time at work, helping others, mentoring them, coaching them to have a better understanding of their safety and health program and coordinate all that. Um, one of Steve's jobs is to look at uh, reviewing accidents. I meet with him once a quarter and Steve and I go over accidents and we say, hey, here's, here's your claims. Do you know how many accidents they have? Very few. But we can go back in history and say, here's where your accidents have occurred. Let's prevent those in the future. Um, Steve spends time on training. Steve spends time on safety meetings. Uh, Steve has follow-up concerns. He'll, he'll contact me on a regular basis and say, um, I need help with this. Can you please help me? Uh, there, are, there are several of you on the webinar today that, that do the same thing with myself, with Dominique, with Corwin, and some of you with Luis now that he's, he's on board. Um, that safety and health program that you've got isn't something that you just take it and put it on a shelf and now you're good. In 1984, Washington Farm Bureau started our retro program. And we grew over a number of years. In the early 90s, we said, hey, we really need a safety and health generic program that our members can have. So we used to kill reams and reams and reams of, we used to kill trees and reams and reams and reams of paper, putting together binders. How many of you have the old Farm Bureau safety binder that's a three ring binder? Uh, some of you probably do. And we would give those out to employers. We would print those up and we would put them in binders. We spent tons of time on it. And those went out to employers. And many employers would grab those and go, ha, now I'm in compliance. And they'd stick it on a shelf. And when and back then it was just Corwin and I that were safety directors. Corwin and I would come out to the operation and we'd say, hey, do you have your written safety plan? Do you have your written accident prevention program? And they'd say, yeah. I've got it here somewhere, it's in the shop, let's go get it. And you'd go and pick it up off the shop shelf and you pull it off and <laughs> blow all of the dust off of it. And uh, we'd open it up and it would be pristine and clean and all the pages were blank because it was never dealt with. It was said, ha, I'm in compliance. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning of this webinar. This isn't something you can just have on the shelf, set and go, now I'm in compliance, I never have to worry about it again. Uh, if you're the owner operator, you are the safety coordinator. 
you wear many, many hats. Um, Steve is a good example of the average safety coordinator for a company. He doesn't do just safety, but that's one of the things that he does. And he's good at it. And the employer is processing moving forward and, and backing his play. And the employer jumps in from time to time and says, hey, what do we need? Let's let's keep this thing going. So they've they've coordinated their program so it is much more than just a set it on the shelf, there's my accident prevention program. Many of you are doing food safety. When food safety auditors come and they do food safety audits for you, GAP, Global GAP, or SQF, or Primus, and, and the auditor comes in, they go through your records. They want to they want to see your records. They want to know if you're actually doing what you say you are. It's the same thing with this. They really, you, you really need to take a look at this and say, if I can't coordinate this and make sure that it's effective and done, then I need to assign someone to do it. And that's what that employer's done with Steve. And Steve's doing a great job. So remember that as, you, as you're going through your safety and health program, that you're saying, where am I, wh what needs do I have? You look at, look at the checklists. If, if you go to the uh, other attachment that's with your, with your files there on your nine steps to safety and look at the very last page, it's, uh, the page is attachment B as in Bravo. You can go through a safety inspection guide and you can say, here's, the, here's a general guide of the things that I should be looking at. How do I make sure that I've got all this stuff in place? And you can go through that and say, does that need a written safety plan with it? And do I need someone to help me with it? If you don't have a safety coordinator, get a hold of us. We'll jump you. We'll we'll help you. We'll jump right in and help. We'll jump you through the hoops. Uh, we'll help you as as needed. Uh, what, one thing, Jeff, if I can comment on that, uh, I think when companies do make um, uh, the decision to to assign somebody as their safety coordinator. One thing that I've um, seen that gets sort of missed and then becomes problematic down the road is uh, whoever uh, gives that authority, you know, gives those responsibilities to that safety coordinator, make sure that uh, responsibilities and more importantly, their authority is very clearly understood by all. Um, because there are times where I've seen businesses put somebody in charge of safety but yet they have no authority to actually do anything and and that's okay as long as somebody in the business is ultimately going to be the one to take those ideas or take action on those safety concerns uh, that do need to be addressed yeah it's even if someone is your safety coordinator and they say to employees this is the process that we're moving forward with and the employee says well you're not my boss um i don't need to listen to you then it's the coordinator's job to go back to the boss is and and take that employee with them and say you know the ultimate authority lies with the boss the ultimate authority lies with the owner um because if it all goes to hell in a handbasket, the owner's the one that's going to prison if there's problems. So Rick's right in that there's authority that needs to be given. Sometimes you don't want to give all that authority out. That's okay as long as that employee has the opportunity to step in and say, let's move forward and let's have uh, the owner or the boss or the supervisor allow to uh, either issue the authority to that coordinator uh, or um, move that up the level of, of the management chain to where it's more of a, um, uh, a, a process of, of that authority being given. One of the worst things that can happen is when a safety coordinator says to um, someone, um, you're fired, uh, as, as the worst case scenario, you're fired. And then, they, then the employee goes around that safety coordinator and goes to the boss and says, well, I just fired Jeff. And the boss says, you can't fire Jeff. He's our best employee. And they hire him back or they tell him, no, you're not really fired. And they've just gutted all of the authority that that safety coordinator had. So be careful as you're assigning uh, uh, authority to those safety coordinators. Yeah, and one other piece of authority that I've always, you know, recommended employers do grant, you know, to a point is, you know, you, you've assigned somebody to be a safety coordinator because they're going to be your most trained person on safety. 
uh, you would think they are able to recognize hazards and you know the ability to stop work and call it a, a timeout even if it's just for a few brief minutes to kind of get everybody together and say look i think this is dangerous and this is why um and so that's one that i've seen where some people are assigned as safety coordinators but they don't have the authority to stop work and then it ultimately ends up in somebody getting getting seriously injured on the job yeah, it's a tough deal. It's something that management needs to be in the trenches with with the crew to know where those deficiencies are. And, and that's part of the reason for the management commitment statement at the beginning that we talked about. It's part of the um, observations of people and their and how they do things and a discipline policy that goes along with that it's it's not easy and as rick Costellum is our chief financial officer at the uh, farm bureau he's also our hr coordinator and it's a difficult job at times it's like herding cats it's like herding cats it's hard to do so you've got the safety plan you've made management commitment you've put it into place You've trained people, you've educated them, and you still have an accident. Now what do I do? Because you never know when you're going to have the next accident. What we're in safety excellence, what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid that serious life altering accident. Um, if you have someone that is blatantly not applying the rules in the workplace whether it's a supervisor or lead, whether it's a crew leader, whether it's a management team member, whether it's an employee that's saying that that doesn't apply to me, or it's an employee that's insubordinate. Uh, it's time to step up and say, we've got to make sure that we don't have serious life altering injuries. We wanna make sure that people go home at the end of the day with the same eyes and toe, eyes and ears and fingers and toes that they came with at the beginning of the day. Um, if you get people to buy off on it, in Spanish, the, there's a word called la vida. La vida, it's the life, but it means so much more than that. It means well-being, it means salud, it means salutations, it means all part of being a um, a whole person. And la, it's a great word, la vida. La vida means so much more than just life. And when there's a life altering event, and that could be from an amputation of a finger to a, a, a serious injury that, that requires hospitalization over a long period of time, those are life changing events. Those are the ones we want to avoid. So you have all of these things in place and you've, you end up having an accident anyway. So now what do you do? Well, you, you have to go to step eight and you have to say, all right, first off, um, someone in the field, if there's an injury, should know, is this something that we should just call 911 or is this something that someone can be transported to uh, care? Uh, and that's part of your emergency action plan. It's part of your emergency process that you're going to do. Um, that's covered in an orientation. That's covered in your written safety plan. How are we going to manage this? Sometimes it's easier to call 911 and get services on the way in an ambulance uh, and possibly sheriff to come and, and, and assist. And then later on say, boy, we probably didn't need to do that. But would you rather need to do it and not, or not need to and do it? Um, so you've, you've got this process that you say, all right, if there's an emergency, this is what we're going to do. You should probably get with a local medical clinic or um, hospital and establish a working relationship with them. You should be able to let them know, hey, if we have an injured worker, we're nearby here, this is where we're going to bring them. And if you can bring them to the doctor, that's the best of all worlds. Many times people will get, well, I'm, I'm fine, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do an accident investigation here after I've had an accident, I'm okay, it's all right, I'm gonna go back to work. And then in the nighttime, they start getting stiff and sore, and they say, well, I think I'll go to the emergency room. And what's the first thing the emergency room says? Oh, well, we're gonna transfer your care to your general practitioner, but you need to take at least three days off, sometimes a week off. Well, if you've got a relationship with a medical provider and you convey that to the medical provider and to the employees, the employees are much more likely to go to that medical provider and work with them on modified duty jobs. Um, 
the nature of your business, what it is you do. Um, educate your employees about procedures on, on how to make sure that if you're injured, we want you to go to the doctor, we want you to get taken care of, we, and, and, and report those injuries immediately. And then develop a modified duty job, modified duty that is returned to work, that you can have um, productivity out of someone. If, if you get 50% productivity out of them and you've cleared the uh, injured worker through a doctor to come back to work on a light duty job that's cleared by the doctor, you can submit that to Labor and Industries and you get 50% of that money back. It's already being taken out of your premiums. You might as well take advantage of that. It's called stay at work. If you don't know about stay at work, please contact us at Farm Bureau. We'll walk you through that and help you with it. But stay at work gives you 50% of that wage back. So you say, well, someone got injured and they're only a 50% employee. It, well, you're getting 50% back anyway. So you, you can do all the work and still have injuries. But remember, it's not those life altering injuries that, that it's, it's the minor ones that you're still going to have and then you need to have this process in place ahead of time. Well, Jeff, uh, you know, cut his finger pretty bad and maybe they're gonna have light duty for him for a little bit of not using his, it's, it's his index finger on his right hand. Well, don't use your right hand for uh, two weeks. So then there needs to be some transitional job that I can go into. Otherwise it goes to time loss and Jeff doesn't work at all. And after Jeff doesn't work for about 60 to 90 days, Jeff gets really comfortable watching TV in the morning and uh, getting my kids off to school and having a cup of coffee and I can sit around and watch TV and because TV is the news is just wonderful these days. And uh, I get in this routine of not going to work and uh, it happens to the best of people. So it's something that a light duty return to work um, process should be in place. You might even talk to that physician and go, hey, here's a list of jobs that we've got for, for injured workers. And then, like I say, work with uh, the Farm Bureau claim staff. We could spend a whole bunch of time just on stay at work. And if, you're, uh, if you've been attending our webinars, uh, Rick Klein did one recently on industrial insurance. And uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, but uh, vital information to have. So uh, how am I going to verify that I've gotten all this done? How do I make sure that I've I've um, covered all my bases. Well, you can use some, some lagging indicators and a lagging indicator is an OSHA recordable accident or lost time accident uh, log. So you can look at your OSHA log and go, well, here's the injuries that I had. Um, you can look at uh, Farm Bureau gives you quarterly reports uh, on your losses, on claims that have happened on your operation. You can look at those. Those are all called lagging indicators. You can look at those and say, well, gosh, here's the things that have happened, so let's prevent those in the future. They're important, but the better ones are to say, let's perform routine walk-around inspections. Let's look at the workplace. I know. Let's have employees report uh, unsafe practices or hazards in the workplace. Um, Here's an example. Hey Jeff, are there any uh, workplace hazards that you see? Yep, the bathroom is really cold in the winter time. Well, that's probably not a safety issue unless the heater is broken and there's wires sticking out of the heater and there's it's a fire hazard. That's a, that's a workplace safety hazard. But if it's a general complaint about gee, you know, um, this piece of equipment I'm using is about five years old and we need a new one and it's $10,000. If the old one will work and the old one is good, then let's use the old one. It's, it's not necessarily something that is vital to my job or my job safety. So you'll have to gauge it when you ask employees, what, what should we do uh, to make sure that we have a, a safer workplace? Put up a suggestion box and see what kind of things you get in it. Um, more vacation time, higher pay. Those are the, those are great things. And there's, and it doesn't diminish those. Those are great things. But, uh, if you, if you really want to know how to, uh, how to manage your, your workplace, you've got good review, you've got, um, good walk around inspections. You're asking employees, what do you need? What are, what are the things that we can do to eliminate hazards in the workplace? You use your eyes to tell me what it is you, you, uh, you need. And it goes back to that first comment that I made about what is a good leader. A good leader is someone that coaches and builds and mentors people to get to the position that they can do it themselves. Rick said at the beginning, common sense. 
they should call it uncommon sense because it's really not that common anymore. If you um, look on a yearly basis, you get your experience modification rating from labor and industries. That experience modification rating gives you your info on what your costs are compared to others uh, in the industry. So uh, if I'm a dairy and I am, my, I look at my experience rating and it says I'm at 1.0, I'm, I'm average. I'm the same as everyone else. And it's usually 1.000, that's, that's I'm average. I'm paying 100% of that rate. But if I'm a safe dairy or I've been lucky and I'm at a 0.75, that means I'm saving 25%. Uh, or if I'm a dairy that hasn't paid attention or I've had some unfortunate accidents that have been more life altering, my rate rises and I'm at 1.25, that means I'm paying 25% more. So look at your rating. That's one of the things you, you could say is, here's my rating, I'm at a 0.75. That's really good. Can we drive that lower? Uh, I saw one just a couple of weeks ago that was 0.56. 0.56, that is unheard of for an experience modification rating. And this is a larger company that uh, has about a million dollars in premium every year. And they're at a 0.56. That's a fantastic rate. That means they're paying 56% of the rate compared to everyone else. Everyone else is at one on average, they're at 0.56. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. Um, that kind of covers all of the things that we uh, that we wanted to to give you information on uh, on the webinar today. If there's questions, make sure you get those to us and get them answered. And you know, I don't always work out, but when I do, I expect immediate spectacular results. So remember that this isn't something that you can say I'm going to do this and I'm going to have immediate spectacular results because it's not. It's something that happens over a long period of time. So questions, concerns assistance, make sure you shout to us and we will endeavor to get to you as soon as we can and help you wherever we can. Thanks so a lot. with that, Rick, you wanna close? Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, I've been answering some questions on the back end uh, while you were presenting. Um, we'll go ahead and leave the webinar up here for about another two or three minutes in case you wanna take down Jeff's information and phone number. Uh, those of you that are not um, participating in our Farm Bureau Retro Safety Services, please feel free to reach out to us and we can talk to you about getting signed up for those consultation services. And then lastly, remember you've got those two handouts there. Uh, you can download those uh, and, and refer back to them as needed. Again, thanks everyone for attending today. Hope the rest of your uh, uh, um, seasons go well. and. Um, uh, it ha hopefully, all have a safe and not so harsh winter. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone.